In Europe in the 1840s, one of the most dangerous places a pregnant mother could find herself was inside a maternity hospital. Frequent epidemics of a bacterial infection called puerperal fever or childbed fever would regularly break out in hospitals across the continent, even under the finest medical care available, as many as 16 out of every 100 births ended with the death of the mother. In 1846, Hungarian physician Ignaz Semmelweis was appointed to what was then by far the largest maternity hospital in the world, the Vienna Maternity Hospital, as an assistant to the hospital's director, Professor of Obstetrics Johann Klein. The hospital was divided into two clinics. Doctors and medical students were employed in the first clinic, midwives in the second. Semmelweis discovered that mothers giving birth at the first clinic under the care of some of Europe's best physicians, were three times more likely to die than mothers admitted to the second clinic. Women arriving at Vienna Maternity Hospital on a Sunday, Monday, Wednesday or Friday were sent to the first clinic. Any other day of the week, they would be seen at the second, midwife-led clinic. Semmelweis regularly saw women fall to their knees and beg not to be admitted to the first clinic. But what was the cause of childbed fever? And why were so many expectant mothers dying at the doctor-led clinic? Semmelweis began unraveling the mystery, and for his efforts he would become known as the savior of mothers. But it would cost him everything. In 1665, Robert Hooke, with the help of the newly invented microscope, published Microphagia, or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses. The book was a smash hit and the public were entranced by his images of a finely structured and previously unseen miniature world. Ten years later, London's Royal Society began to receive drawings and reports from an unknown Dutch draper called Antony van Leeuwenhoek. Using microscopes of his own design, he was achieving incredible magnification. After he reported finding what he called animalcules in a sample of pepper water in 1676, Members of the Royal Society spent a year with the best devices English technology could produce searching for these little animals before getting the magnification right. What Leeuwenhoek had found were protozoa, and he wouldn't stop there. In 1683, Leeuwenhoek discovered bacteria. So in 1846, when Semmelweis took up a position at the Vienna Maternity Hospital, the existence of microbes was well known, but they were not thought to play a role in infection and disease. The prevailing theory at the time was miasma theory, holding that disease was the result of environmental emanations or miasmas, infectious mists or noxious vapors emanating from the garbage, sewage, animal carcasses and wastes that were a feature of urban living. The theory was largely on the right track as bacteria does drive decay, but it was also completely wrong. Semmelweis began looking at the data and found that shockingly, Many women prefer to give birth on the street and then attend the clinic so they could avail of the childcare benefits without being admitted to the clinic. And based on the figures, they were right to do so. Women who gave birth on the street or on the way to the hospital were overwhelmingly safer than those giving birth in the hospital. Semmelweis, distraught at what he felt was the unnecessary deaths of so many mothers, took action despite having no sense of what was causing childbed fever. He wrote in his book, The Etiology, Concept and Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever. I, like a drowning person grasping at a straw, discontinued supine deliveries, which had been customary in the first clinic, in favor of deliveries from a lateral position. I did this for no other reason than the latter were customary in the second clinic. I did not believe that the supine position was so detrimental that additional deaths could be attributed to its use, but in the second clinic, deliveries were performed from a lateral position and the patients were healthier. You can sense Semmelweis's frustration and of course changing the birthing position from supine to lateral had no effect. He explored overcrowding as a potential cause and found no link to childbed fever as the second clinic was always more crowded than the first. He even studied if the embarrassment of being examined by male doctors was causing the fever. But again, he could find no link to the infection. In 1847, Semmelweis took a trip to Venice. He wrote, I hope that Venetian art treasures would revive my mind and spirits 
which had been so seriously affected by my experiences in the maternity hospital. But when he arrived back in Vienna two weeks later, he was greeted with the news that his friend and colleague, Professor Jacob Kolechka, had died. Kolechka had been accidentally cut by a student's scalpel while doing an autopsy on a mother who had died of childbed fever. The wound was minor, but Kolechka fell ill, showing symptoms very similar to childbed fever, and just days later, he was dead. For Semmelweis, this was a tragic eureka moment. When Johann Klein became director of the Vienna Maternity Hospital in 1823, he enacted a new policy of routine post-mortems for teaching purposes. The doctors and students who worked in the second clinic would start their day performing autopsies as part of their medical training. Then in the afternoons, the physicians and students worked in the second clinic examining patients and delivering babies. The midwives had no such contact. They only worked in their clinic. Semmelweis hypothesized that Kolechka contracted childbed fever due to cadaverous particles on the scalpel blade that cut him. And what's more, those same particles were present on the hands of students and doctors as they left the hospital mortuary and went to see patients in the clinics. Whatever pathogens doctors came in contact with during an autopsy would be taken into the maternity ward and passed on to mothers. The revelation was staggering. If true, childbed fever, which caused so many unnecessary deaths in the major teaching hospitals of Europe, was man-made and completely preventable. Semmelweis implemented mandatory hand washing among the students and doctors who worked for him at the Vienna Maternity Hospital. Rather than relying on plain soap, Semmelweis used a chlorinated lime solution because, holding with miasma theory, it totally removed the smell of decay that lingered on the doctor's hands. The doctors began sanitizing themselves and their instruments, and the mortality rate in the second clinic plummeted. In the spring of 1850, Semmelweis took to the stage at the prestigious Vienna Medical Society and extolled the virtues of hand washing to a crowd of doctors. His theory flew in the face of accepted medical wisdom at the time, and by accepting Semmelweis's conclusion, doctors were admitting that they were to blame for the many thousands of deaths caused by childbed fever. They didn't accept his findings, and his theory was widely rejected. Semmelweis didn't help his own cause. A notoriously difficult man, he had an aversion to writing up and publishing his data, and thereby informing a wider audience. In fact, his only early published material is from his presentation at the Vienna Medical Society, where they are part of the recorded proceedings. It would be 10 years before he would officially publish his findings and the supporting data in his book. Despite practically eliminating childbed fever, incredibly, the Vienna Hospital abandoned mandatory handwashing and Semmelweis found his position as assistant professor in gynecology was not renewed. Unable to find another position, he was forced to return home to Budapest. On May 20th, 1851, Semmelweis took a relatively insignificant and unpaid position as head physician at a hospital in Pest. Childbed fever was rampant at the hospital. After taking over in 1851, Semmelweis virtually eliminated the disease. Meanwhile, in France, biologist and chemist Louis Pasteur was working as a professor of chemistry at the University of Strasbourg. In 1856, he was approached by a local winemaker who was struggling with wine souring. Pasteur began to look into the process of fermentation and found that it was bacterial contamination that was souring the wine. He would go on to invent the process that bears his name, pasteurization, the process of heating packaged foods to eliminate pathogens and extend shelf life. Pasteur then turned his attention to the health of silkworms, which produce silk for the clothing industry. He discovered that healthy silkworms became ill when they nested in the bedding of those suffering from disease. In this study, Pasteur found that environment directly affected contagion and that the spread of disease could be controlled by sterilization. His studies on yeast had shown that microbes could be airborne, and he realized that these two studies could be directly applied to the transmission of disease in humans. In Germany, Robert Koch was also working on microbiology. In fact, it would be his assistant, Julius Richard Petrie, who would be credited with inventing the Petri dish in 1881. But Koch is most widely known for identifying the bacteria that causes anthrax. 
In 1876, he observed rod-shaped bacteria in the blood of cows that had died from the disease and suspected they caused anthrax. When Koch infected mice with blood from anthrax-stricken cows, the mice also developed anthrax. Pasteur was also working on anthrax. Quite by accident, he discovered a method of producing less infectious bacteria, initially working with avian cholera. He moved on to anthrax after Koch made his discovery. Pasteur discovered that when the less infectious pathogens were injected into a host, they only got mildly sick and then recovered. What's more, if they were later infected with a potent strain of the bacteria, they were immune to the disease. Pasteur and Koch had definitively proved that pathogens cause disease and taken the first steps towards vaccination. Miasma theory's time had come. A new theory began to take shape, the germ theory of disease. It was the proof that Semmelweis needed, but it came much too late. Semmelweis had died in 1865. He was only 47, and his final years were tumultuous. After a number of unfavorable reviews of his 1861 book, Semmelweis lashed out against his critics in a series of open letters. They were full of bitterness, desperation, and fury. Semmelweis was clearly burdened by what he knew to be the completely preventable deaths of so many of his patients. He knew that he and all his colleagues had blood on their hands. In his book he wrote, I must affirm that only God knows the number of patients who went prematurely to their graves because of me. I have examined corpses to an extent equaled by few other obstetricians. If I say this also of another physician, my intention is only to bring to consciousness the truth that, to humanity's great misfortune, has remained unknown through so many centuries. No matter how painful and oppressive such a recognition may be, the remedy does not lie in suppression. In 1861, Semmelweis started to suffer from various nervous complaints. He suffered from severe depression and became excessively absent-minded. He turned every conversation to the topic of childbed fever. In his biography of Semmelweis, author K. Codell Carter wrote, It was impossible to appraise the nature of Semmelweis's disorder. It might have been Alzheimer's disease, which is associated with rapid cognitive decline and mood changes. It might have been third-stage syphilis, a then common disease of obstetricians who examined thousands of women at free clinics. Or it might have been emotional exhaustion from overwork and stress. In July 1865, Semmelweis was lured back to Vienna under the pretense of visiting a friend and colleague's recently opened medical institution. He was instead brought to a Viennese mental asylum and committed. When he realized what was about to happen, he tried to flee. He was severely beaten by the guards, subdued and secured in a straitjacket, then confined to a darkened cell. He died two weeks later from a wound on his right hand, which might have been caused in the struggle with the guards. The wound became infected and Semmelweis died from sepsis, essentially the same disease he fought so hard to prevent. In 1867, two years after Semmelweis's death, Scottish surgeon Joseph Lister, building on the work of Pasteur and Koch, also put forward the idea of sanitizing hands and surgical instruments to halt infectious diseases. He too met with resistance, but the evidence was becoming overwhelming, and by the 1870s, surgeons were regularly scrubbing up. More than a century after Semmelweis's theories were mocked, the Medical University of Budapest changed its name to Semmelweis University in honor of his unsung persistence, and he would become known as the savior of mothers.